Hi folks, it's Andy and welcome to this week's Kendo Rant. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. Uh, we've got some fantastic questions for you. Um, we'll, we'll get to them in just a moment. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe. Hit the Kendo bell. When you hit subscribe, a little bell appears. That is called the Kendo bell. If you ring that bell, you're going to start getting better at Kendo from that very moment. So don't miss out. Hit subscribe. Hit that Kendo bell and start improving at Kendo right now. Don't forget as well, you can support the channel by shopping at kendostar.com. That's my website, of course. Of course, I'd say it's brilliant, amazing, fantastic, the best kendo equipment in the universe. But if you don't believe me, check out our Trustpilot rating. That's an independent reviews aggregate, by the way. Only verified customers are able to post reviews on there. And we are one of the highest rated online stores on all of Trustpilot, not just in uh, kendo equipment uh, retail, but on the whole of e-commerce. All right, so get on to kendostar.com and support us making more content. Okay, first question. This one came to me by email. Uh, Dear Fish Sensei, thank you for allowing me to contact you with my Kendo-ish question. Um, some background. Due to various family and illness-related issues, my Sensei runs our local Kendo club has been unable to attend for a couple of months. And as such, I've had to step up and do my best to keep things going. That being said, in the most recent training session, two of my fellow students got into quite a heated argument. Uh, they were kind enough to leave it until the end of practice. Uh, sadly, I did not witness any particular, grievance, the, uh, any particular grievance occur as I was busy with my current partner in the rotation. And for those, these purposes, it doesn't really matter. My main question is, do you have any advice on how to be a better sensei? More so as a teacher, I guess, as I certainly would not consider myself sensei in, uh, in an external to our dojo setting. I feel like perhaps I need uh, to be more aware of what's happening in the room. It feels difficult to balance that with also trying to teach and provide a safe environment for practice. I was also curious if, there's something, if this is something you ever encountered in your kendo career. Did you feel a distinct change from being senpai to being sensei, uh, even in your own dojo before becoming more renowned nationally or externally? Thank you in advance for any advice you can impart in the strange and uncertain area of my kendo journey. I find myself, uh, sorry if this is a little lengthy and I appreciate that you're busy. Kind regards to yourself, your family and hardworking kendo star employees. Thank you very much. Okay, so... Right, so you're taking over as the sort of sensei of your dojo because your main sensei isn't able to come. Uh, yeah, happens a lot, right? Um, and, you know, you've had an issue where a couple of uh, students have sort of got into some sort of argument with each other. Um, <clears throat> and how do you deal with that sort of thing? So, look, um, yeah, when you're in charge of, you know, operating the class... Yeah, you've got to kind of have a bit of an eye everywhere. Um, and I have had a similar situation. Um, it's 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 harder when you're also involved in actually practicing as well. It's obviously a lot easier when you're sort of externally. Like it happens sometimes with kids. Um, I mean, not really to diminish the argument that whatever the students had, but, you know, like in Japan when I was teaching kids, kids would sometimes sort of start arguing with each other. Um, but, you know, you're not, part of their practice you're sort of outside so it's easy to sort of um stop that in its tracks but I have had it happen as well with adults where I've been sort of practicing as well I've seen it sort of happen um yeah you have to kind of you do have to kind of have your sort of radar on all the time and sort of know where everyone is and what's going on um which it does make things difficult but you'll come with practice you know it's a skill in itself um the thing is is what you have to do more importantly and you say about a change from being senpai to sensei. Um, <clears throat> it's a bit difficult for me to answer that because no, I didn't really have that experience because I did a massive chunk. Most of most of the kendo I've done, I did in Japan. Um, I came back a couple of years ago and I went out to Japan after doing kendo for what, five or six years or something. Um, so I've done more kendo in Japan than I've done outside of Japan so far. Um, 
And yeah, it wasn't that sort of situation for me. Um, but, but look, being the dojo leader or leading the practice, the fact of the matter is, is it doesn't matter about your own ability or skill level. You have to assume a certain level of authority um, and take charge of the situation. It doesn't matter if you, it doesn't matter how good you are at kendo. That isn't the, uh, that isn't relevant to the, the issue at hand. Um, so you have to be able to, and it's, it can be difficult. And I've, I've had to sort of, sort of turn to people that are potentially sort of more experienced than me even and say, well, 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 hang on a minute, what's going on here? You know, um, and sort of deescalate a situation. I've seen it a couple of times actually. Um, and sort of had to get involved. But the fact of the matter is, you know, especially when everybody's adults, everybody's, you know, I'm sure that whatever argument was occurring between the two students that you raised, for example, I'm sure both of them had a, a, a sort of legitimate point to make, but obviously there's some kind of misunderstanding between each other. Um, and then what you have to do is kind of get, <laughs> you know, if you notice that involved, uh, that happening, you know, I'd, you know, I'd be like, look, um, and yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate them leaving it till the end of practice, but at the same time, it's something that has to get resolved and removed and finished. Otherwise, it's going to crop, crop up again later. So something I've done in the past when I've seen that sort of thing happen, I've just tackled it straight away and say, hey, what's going on here? Right, what's up with you? Right, okay, you think that. And what's up with you? You think that. Okay, well, look, this is how it is. So that's the end of it. Um, and you have to kind of take command of the situation in that respect. Um, and then, you know, if one of them starts arguing back or something like just right, okay, well, let's talk about it later. But for now, do it like that or don't do it. Yeah. Um, it's tough. It's tough. But that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing you've got to do when you're in charge, unfortunately. <laughs> I hope that helps anyway. Uh, next one. Hello, Andy. Uh, I hope your family are safe and well. Uh, yes, thank you. I wanted to ask for Kendall Rant. Where does the Shinai number 39, 38 or 37 come from? Thanks in advance. I'm really glad you asked this. Um, so it comes from the length. It's three, it's three Shaku and nine Sun or three Shaku and eight Sun and three Shaku and seven Sun. Um, they're the traditional Japanese measurements. Okay. Um, one Sun is about three centimeters. It's 3.03 centimeters. Um, so that's where it comes from. All right. It comes from that. It is exclusively, and I really want to make this point. I make this a lot in these videos, but for some reason, not everybody in the world watches these videos. Can't imagine why, but, <laughs> um, the length that it refers exclusively to the length of the Shinai. It's not connected to the weight of the Shinai. All right. I really am trying my best in this world. Like, like about five years ago, I was working really hard to dispel the myth that tighter burger stitching means better, you know, is better. And actually, it's about the materials and craftsmanship. Um, I've been saying that for years and it's start, starting to sort of uh, sink in now. But now my crusade is like trying to <laughs> trying to uh, get people to realize the, the length of the Shinai is specifically only the length of the Shinai. And adults use a three a three Shaku nine sun Shinai, 120 centimeters, right? Regardless of the gender. Um so adult women use a 39 women Shinai and not a 38 Shinai. Um and it's yeah, um it's something that's like it's a massive misnomer that's been sort of in certainly in Europe. Um I expect in other areas outside of Japan as well, um, where adult women have been going around saying, uh, you know, or being told that, oh, they should use a 38, when it's not true, they should be using an adult lady's 39, which is weighted lighter. Um, usually what happens is they've been, like, it comes from, I'm going on a tangent here, but this is Kendall Rant, it's my show. So, <laughs> um, where that's come from, I think, is the, like, bog shops um, that have been selling outside of Japan that, particularly ones that are run by people that don't do kendo or know much about kendo and they just use a uh, 38 size shinai which is meant for a high school boy um and obviously it's they're often cheaper for them to buy and then sort of marketing them to sell to women because they're closer to the weight regulation than a man's 39 um but it's totally wrong all right so if you're an adult woman or if you teach adult women the correct size they should be wear, uh, should be using is a women's 39 they shouldn't be using size 38 
and it's not connected to height either, so don't give me that rubbish. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure I don't use a short should I? Um, my dojo lost its space in the pandemic and we've been visiting neighboring dojos until we uh, get a new one. As such, I've done Keiko with a lot of new senseis. I was wondering if a sensei does Keiko with a student they've never met before, like at a seminar or something, how do they gauge what level or difficult of Keiko to do with the student? Um, all right, so you're talking about from the sensei's point of view, if they're practicing with a new student, how do they gauge what level they should go at? the new student one it depends on the context of this of the keiko um and two um you know like speaking to someone in that position um you know in the first five to ten seconds okay you you, you can get an idea all right that's that's why we sit on grading panels and stuff we're pretty good at judging judging someone's ability from a very short excerpt of, of their kendo ability. And sometimes it surprises and go, oh, okay, oh, this actually is, is better than I first gave him credit for. Fair enough. And then we might adjust. But um, yeah, uh, it depends on the context. But for the most part, we, we can tell. Um, I, I can't really say how, but you can just you can just tell within the first few minutes few seconds to be honest most senseis a lot of senseis and something i do as well is if it's a brand new person you got no idea who it is to be honest you can tell by the way they do sonkyo and the way they do chudan or kamai as well and often how they wear the borgo um that is also another clear indicator which is why it's important to learn to do all that stuff properly um so yeah uh, hi Andy, two questions for today. Uh, you mentioned in the past that beginners doing Jigeko with someone who's higher rank should always just attack. Uh, is it okay to try some Shikakuaza while doing so? Uh, or is it best to just go for it? Our sensei has practiced a few during Uchikomi pair drills, but I'm unsure if I should use them or not. B, on the Kote, there's a sort of thin spot with the Kazari on it between the Kera um, and the Futon. Oh, right, okay. It covers, the, uh, it covers the back of your hand. Do you think this area could ever be redesigned? I know it's thinner, so the wrist can move easier, but it still stings pretty good when a missed strike lands there and seems sort of like the Achilles heel spot to the Kote to me. Okay, the good questions. Uh, so the first one about, um, yeah, I mean, when you're, if you're sort of lower ranked and you're going against the high ranked sen sensei, the best is to just focus on attacking techniques. That is Shikakewaza. Shikakewaza is attacking techniques. I wouldn't worry too much about Ojiwaza or just trying to beat them um it depends again on the context of the keiko that you're having of course but if you want to get the most out of your own kendo practice you should just try to make successful strikes with with good spirit um and don't care not don't care but don't um hesitate um and don't be afraid if they're not successful and or if you receive the sort of retaliation strikes um and as you sort of go up you know, once you get sort of past Shodan and Nidan and stuff like that, then it doesn't necessarily mean you do them mindlessly. You have to kind of still try to sort of look for an opportunity that the sensei might present you with. Um, but it is better for the most part to focus on the, on the, on the attacking waza. Um, on the kote, you're talking about um, the, the, the part that sort of is basically the wrist joint. Um, I don't have a pair of kote about here. Um, but... Uh, no, I don't think it can be redesigned. Um, it's been people have tried to redesign it, and all that happens is a cut there that you can't really move, um, and then uh, it's a bigger problem than than it solves. It causes a bigger problem than it solves. Um, so yeah, the problem is right is that people concentrate too much on just whacking at the cut there without caring about accuracy, and they just try to hit it as hard as they can. So um, you know, until people. What people should be doing, um, and this isn't you, of course, and I don't know what I'm talking more about is the people you're partnered with, but you shouldn't get hit there very often. Um, I hardly ever get hit there, but um, if you're getting hit there in Diego, then um, try not to lift your hands too much and try to keep your kamae. Um, and if you're getting hit there, like during Kihon, then one, look at how it, how you're receiving, and then two, um you know unfortunately the 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 person attacking needs to work on their accuracy um it's not that hard to hit kote accurately in kihon all you have to do is swing the shinai straight okay and provided the motodachi is presenting the kote clearly then you should hit if they start to string it that swing it diagonally and stuff then yeah they're going to start missing it's a difficult one i understand it's not nice to get hit there but um 
yeah um i don't think there's a i don't think there's a i don't think there's a redesign of that that will be effective on the cards anytime soon uh next one have you ever wanted to learn nito no <laughs> that's not true of course when i first started kendall but when i first started kendall when i was a beginner and a sort of um you know uh idiot teenager i thought it'd be cool to do uh to do nito and i made myself a little, sh little short and i probably had a go at it at my, do at my local dojo um back in the day um but no um i don't i don't i don't I sometimes think about um, exploring it more um, from the point of view as someone that's involved in coaching now, um, especially if if I continue to be involved in coaching uh, competitive teams, um, then obviously Nito is something that does exist. Um, so it might be something that I have to explore at some point just to get a better understanding of it. Um, but it's not something I particularly want to, uh, want to do, um, to be honest. Hi Andy, from time to time I hurt my left Achilles heel when I'm training. Uh, does it, uh, I think you mean Achilles tendon, right? Um, does it have something to do with my technique? Uh, what do you recommend me? Thank you. Um, I, I'm not a doctor, so I don't really know. I'm not good at giving uh, medical advice, uh, but um, it could be technique. One could be um, that your left heel is too high in your camera and you're putting too much stre stress on it. Must make sure you stretch it, make sure you exercise it, make sure that um, if you can sort of do some sort of working out, like uh, calf raises and stuff like that are usually quite good to strengthen that area. Um, and then otherwise, you've just got to take care of it, make sure you stretch it properly. Um, and not just before practice, probably daily is a probably a good idea to, to, to stretch it. But from a technique point of view, it's a good, there's a good chance you've got your left heel too high. It's a common problem. Um, and that's just putting a little bit more uh, pressure on your Achilles tendon than, than needs to be there. Uh, next one, what do you do against falling forward while striking um, and keeping good posture? So uh, what you're talking about is when you attack sort of falling forward this way. Um, it comes from your footwork. Your footwork's not good enough. So you need to bring your left foot closer to your right foot probably you're probably too far apart um, and again like the last person your left heel's probably too far off the ground um, or the opposite it's flat on the ground so you need to make sure your left heel's at the right point and then you need to practice your ash sabaki all right moving just just ash sabaki forward and backwards um, but without your upper body moving all right and then as you do from me the same thing you carry your hips forward straight all right, and you must carry your body weight from your lower body and particularly from your left leg. All right, so you have to concentrate more on pushing your right leg forward for Fumikomi from your left leg with a good Fumikiri. That's a launch from the left leg. All right, that's how you sort that one. And also, also keep the, especially if you're doing small waza, keep the tip of your shinai down in kamae for as long as possible. Uh, next one, why are other kinds of kamae not popular like Jordan, Nito or even Gedan? Uh, because they're not as um, they're not as good as Chudan. <laughs> um, like from a competitive point of view, um, they, they're just not as good. Um, you have to be exceptionally good at Jordan um, or Nito to be to have any real success um, against a... a an above average Chudan player. <laughs> um, so that's why, you know, you only, uh, there's only been a, literally a handful, probably three or four. Um, I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I think I can think of four, but there might be more um, Jordan players that have ever been all Japan champions. Um, so, and that's a tournament that's been going for like 70 years. So, um, they're just they're just not as um, you know, especially Gedan is 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 rubbish for for Shinai Kendall. Um, I mean, people use it a bit, um, a bit like Jordan players use Hassel a bit, but it's not like a main kamae. Um, so yeah, uh, that's it. At least that's what the data shows. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Hi Andy, thank you for your great content and teachings. Thank you. Uh, as you have much more insight into kendo in Japan, would you say the approach to teaching kendo at elite universities changed after the incident that led to one top university being suspended 
from all tournaments in the early 2000s or did they just went on after waiting for a few years and would you say the Japanese society in general is facing up such behaviour I hope my question doesn't put you in a difficult spot thank you Ooh, you had to go there <laughs> alright I don't want to talk about the incident that much but um, the incident you're talking about is um, uh, it was in the news I mean it's not secret or anything like that there was a university had to pause its uh, kendo activities um i think for four years um because the student died um and the thing is is it wasn't due to the teaching from my what i understand from what i understand unless i've misunderstood it or if i'm remembering correctly i believe it was other students that um that that, that caused the death of the of the of the of the the student um it was through bullying um so i think it was more of a issue of the culture of the club itself rather than um rather than uh the actual teaching methods um it's hard to say i don't know what the teaching was like around that time because i went to japan after all that had finished and the dust had settled on it all right so i don't really know um it's hard for me to really um say but in terms of the overall sort of tough training that you you sort of um that, that sort of talked about a lot from sort of japanese uh points of view um yeah i mean it, it's, it's still definitely there but it is changing and i don't know whether that's for the for the better or the worse like i say it wasn't from my understanding it wasn't the teaching that that caused the um the incident to happen uh, so i'd separate it from that obviously what happened there was 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 terrible and shouldn't have happened um but like i say i think that was more of an issue of bullying rather than strict teaching um so yeah the thing is is there are still obviously university clubs that are very strict or very hardcore in terms of the training it isn't like it has been in the past and it is getting somewhat softer um because attitudes are changing quite a lot um you see that even in the sort of primary school level uh clubs um but you'll the, you know at the end of the day the fact of the matter is the ones that do still train that really hardcore way are still the most successful ones so it, they, they still haven't found a better way to produce results whether that's for good better or worse i don't know um okay uh do you happen know to know generally what type of cotton cloth is used as the base for ten degree yeah so um it's a type of cotton i don't know what it's sort of called in english or anything like that. i'm no expert on on particular fabric production and stuff but um there's two main types that they use for uh ten degree um there's this um i think it's called bunkiji um and then there's this okakiji and this this okakiji is the more most common one and it just sort of you can see how tightly woven the, the cotton threads are the bunkiji um if that's the right name I, I don't actually know we don't use it um all of our tenagri are generally on the okakiji for the most part um so yeah um i can't really give you much more information than that it's 100 cotton uh, and it's sort of woven like this so yeah, there you go. Uh, sorry, Andy says I mistyped my Kendall rank question last week. Can you uh, over tighten your shinai sudo? Or can it be done up too tightly like it can be too loose? Why is the tension of the sudo important for a shinai to function mechanically? Um, so that's a good question. Um, I don't think you can really over tighten it, but if you pull it too hard, then um, and it is sort of really super tight, then the sudo can snap. And that is possible, all right? So you don't need to go crazy on it, yeah? You don't need to be sort of turning your face blue as you're sort of tightening it like this. Just uh, just pull it really tight and then tie it up, all right? And as long as it's tight and taut and it's not slack, it's fine, all right? Um, you know, if you pull it too tight, the, the string will snap in your hand. Um, or worse is if it is over-tightened, then it could snap mid-practice, so... You don't want that to happen. Uh, the tension of the sudo is important because um, it holds the sakigawa on and it's what holds the whole shinai together. So if it was loose, then that sakigawa, the end part, that can pop off and the, the, the parts could sort of start to, to come apart. It's quite dangerous. So um, it's better to for safety. All right. <clears throat> Last one. Here we are. 
Sabuti should be about 45 degrees and the left hand about a fist in front of the forehead, right? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I look I look with one eye, so I stare against my wrist if I do so. Should I alter the angle, lose the view for a split second, or raise the left hand so I see straight again? So what you're saying is when you lift up, your sort of eye is in front of your wrist. That's not correct, yeah? Um, all right, so if I, if I grab this... Right, have I got enough? Oop, we can't smash everything. We've got enough room behind me. All right, so if I lift this as if I was doing Sabuti, I can go to here, right? Go to here. I personally would go a little bit further back as well. So I'd say a little bit more than a fist from the forehead. It's just a guideline that when you're doing Jordan no Kamae, of course, it's a, it's about a fist away, about, yeah. But you shouldn't, you shouldn't be lifting so you can only... You know, your hands are in front of your face. So it wants to come here for me. Yeah? Men. Up. Men. I can't actually swing back far enough. I don't have enough room. I keep hitting the banner behind me, but... This way. This way. I, I like to I like to lift it high enough so I can feel a slight stretch in my shoulder. Bam. That way. So it's, it does take it a little bit more than a fist away. My left, my left hand goes a bit more than a fist away from my forehead um, when I do that. But, um... It's not the end of the world. Sort of, yeah, just a bit more than a fist away. Um, but yeah, you must you must lift your hands clearly over your head um, so that they're not, you know, in front of your face. It's no good to do like this. It's, it's not it's not really sabuti then, is it? <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, just raise a little bit, you know. this the, the sort of 45 degrees left hand about a fist of the forehead, that's the kind of guidelines should we say all right that's it thank you for joining me today um i hope you enjoyed it we had some fantastic questions there uh don't forget to like share subscribe all that sort of stuff join the kendo show early access group that's where most of these questions have come from all right it's free to join it's on facebook there's a link in the description below that's where all these questions get posted and um, that's where i answer them and not only that when i release instructional videos and i've got more coming soon and um, they go there before they go anywhere else at all all right so if you want to see them before everyone else you need to get in that group it's free to join link in the description shop at kendo star and i'll see you all next time Bye bye